This program is brought to you by Teachers College, Columbia University. Please visit us online at itunes.tc.columbia.edu. It was interesting, but there was very little science under it. And so uh, the opportunity to hear from someone who is putting science under practice and under policy seems to me to be a very, very worthy endeavor. And I'm so glad that we have um, a, a large and I think enthusiastic audience to hear us, um, to hear Chuck Bash's uh, paper on this very important topic. I had an opportunity to get the paper in advance. You got the cliff notes, but the whole paper is really well worth reading, and I understand that you can download it now, and I really urge you to, to read the whole paper because I do think that Dr. Bash has done an incredible job of articulating a framework for thinking about the intersection of research and policy and practice as we try to link education to health. I think that Dr. Bash is very clear about that, that he wants his research to be useful in policy and practice, and I think you will find that um, you, you will not be disappointed. Um, and I think our discussants represent what we're talking about here. We have uh, two discussants who are not, who not only understand policy from their backgrounds, but who are now in a position to make policy, and I think we're going to hear some very interesting comments from them on, on the paper. So you have the biographies of the speakers. I'm not going to read those to you, but I am going to tell you a couple of things that kind of jumped off the page to me as I uh, read their, uh, their bios. Um, I think you see in the bios that Dr. Charles Bash is the Robert March Ho Professor of Education here at Teachers College. He is both a researcher and a teacher. And as I mentioned, he's interested in, in the translation of research into policy and practice. He's been at Teachers College for 25 years. I think that's just terrific. And during that period, he has directed um, about $15 million worth of grant-funded research and program development and has produced over 100 publications. One of his lifelong interests, and you're going to hear about that today, is the influence of health factors on educational outcomes in urban minority youth. Dr. Bash is going to present the key themes and findings from his paper, and then we, were, we will hear from our two discussants, Matthew Yale and Dr. Howell Wexler. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about each of them. So this is Matt Yale uh, sitting next to Dr. Bash. And he was appointed in January 2009 as Deputy Chief of Staff for U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan. And when we met a few minutes ago, I said, explain to me what you do. And he said, well, my, the, my key role is uh, being the liaison, the interdepartmental liaison with other departments. So when the education department works with HHS and justice and agriculture, um, Matt Yale has his fingerprints on that work. So you can see the relevance of his role to the work that we're discussing uh, today. Um, Matthew Yale, uh, before moving to D.C. and joining the U.S. Department of Education, lived and worked in Chicago. He was the Vice President of Public Affairs at Ariel Investments in Chicago for nearly eight years. And as part of his responsibility there, he ran the foundation, and he also directed the firm's civic, government, and political affairs. And his background, not surprisingly, is political science and business. He has a master's in business administration. And then all the way down at the end of the table is Dr. How Howell Wexler, who is currently the director of the Division of Adolescent and School Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. That's the organization affectionately known as DASH. And I think what is uh, perhaps most interesting about Dr. Wexler's background is how he has managed to combine education and public health in his work. He has a doctorate in education from Teachers College and also has a master's in public health from Columbia University. Um, 
I, I think of that as kind of a Prius type background, you know, a hybrid background, and I think that uh, we see lots of manifestations of that that hybrid background in the work that he's done at the CDC, including uh, he was the primary author of the guidelines for school health programs, which many of us in the field um, consider a Bible. And he also had a lead role in the development of the school health index, which is a self-assessment and planning guide. So you can see that we're in good hands today as we hear uh, Dr. Bash's key themes and findings and then hear from our discussants. Thank you, Jane. Um, before getting started, I just want to say thank you to Matt Yale for uh, taking time away from the important work he does on a daily basis for the children of the country, the nation's schools, to come up here today and uh, participate in our session. And to uh, Hal Wexler, very dedicated public servant who I think knows more about school health than just about anyone I know in the United States. I want to thank Mike Rebell for his uh, work on this topic and his team, Jessica Wolf and Jessica Garcia, who are uh, incredibly talented, hardworking, dedicated people. Also, uh, I'd like to thank Fiona Holland, not only for uh, supporting the uh, reception after uh, the, talk, the session today, but also for her support and hard work on this subject, as well as her husband, Ethan Berman. So I, I appreciate that. And uh, finally, I want to thank my wife, Corey, sitting up here, who uh, has been uh, supportive not only for this project, but uh, basically makes life good for me. <laughs> so now, where's the, um, here we go. How do I uh, move the slides? Can somebody tell me that? There we go. Okay. Thanks. we got to go that way. OK. OK. okay. So, yeah, uh, the, the lights furniture. in your eyes, so, please no, feel we free. See this, we want to see the slides. Okay. okay. Okay, so over the past several decades, a variety of strategies have been used to try to help close the achievement gap. Most recently, we've had new standards and accountability, NCLB. Um, we've had different financing. We've had different kinds of te teacher preparation programs, alternative routes to teacher preparation, we've had rigorous program, uh, curriculum, and all those things are important. But all of these things put together are not going to have the desired effect unless the students are motivated and able to learn. Educationally relevant health disparities affect children's motivation and ability to learn. But these factors have been largely overlooked in the education reform movements to date. Health and education outcomes are largely affected by the same underlying factors. Family, physical environment, social environment, and economic environment. But it's become increasingly clear that they exert powerful effects on one another and that these three factors are related in reciprocal ways. Before beginning, I want to talk just a little about what I am going to talk about and what I'm not going to talk about. My, my uh, focus here is on urban minority youth, and uh, that's not to say there's not other, other populations that also have important needs, they do, but this is the topic uh, I chose to focus on. I'm also going to only talk about school-age youth. We all know by now that getting to children before they reach school age in the most formative years, from birth, even before birth, to age five when they start school is going to be incredibly important. And also, I'm only focusing on problems that can be feasibly and effectively addressed through schools. So this gives you an outline of the, the, the entire talk uh, that I'll follow today. I'll start off by talking about the health factors that affect educational outcomes in terms of prevalence and disparities, causal pathways through which they affect education, and what schools can do. And then the second half of the talk is really focusing on solutions, how schools can influence the health of youth and how, and how we need to help them do that. So 
the way I prioritized the factors that I focused on was using three criteria. One was the extent of health disparities. Secondly was the evidence showing causal effects on educational outcomes. And thirdly, the likelihood that schools could do something about these problems. And based on those criteria, I identified seven what I call educationally relevant health factors. And those include vision, asthma, teen pregnancy, aggression and violence, physical activity, breakfast, and ADHD. Um, but in more generally, symptoms of uh, inattention and hyperactivity. So now what I'd like to do is just start talking about each of those seven factors very briefly. These are factors that affect millions and millions of children. Consider vision problems are affected to affect about 20% of youth in America. Asthma affects 14% of the population of youth under 18. That's about 10 million children and adolescents. My screen went blank. Teen pregnancy is expected to affect one in three teens. That's an astounding number. That's just an astounding number, that one in three teens is expected to become pregnant. 28% of adolescents are bullied at school. That's just the tip of the iceberg to other uh, indicators of violence and aggression. Thank you, Dale. Um, two out of three adolescents in America don't have enough physical activity. About 20% of youth skip breakfast on any given day. And 8% of youth aged 6 to 17 have been diagnosed with ADHD. Millions more exhibit symptoms of inattention or hyperactivity, but fall below the diagnostic criteria. All seven of these problems disproportionately affect urban minority youth. This first slide is about visual impairment. There's actually no accurate data on children concerning visual impairment. These data pertain to the population in the United States 12 years of age and older. But they depict what we normally see for most public health problems in America, namely that uh, black and Hispanic populations have higher rates of the problem and people from lower income versus higher income families have higher rates of the problem. In contrast, there's very, very good rates concerning asthma. We see that black children are about 45% more likely than white children to have current asthma. When talking about the asthma rates in the Latino population, you see the importance of disaggregating that group, where over 20% of the Puerto Rican youth have current asthma, while a much lower percent of Mexican-American youth have this chronic disease. Asthma is the most chronic dis physical disease affecting youth in America. Um, what this slide doesn't tell you is that the uh, urban minority youth not only have higher prevalence, but importantly, they have much uh, m higher rates of poorly controlled asthma. And that could be indicated by the overuse of emergency room for care and the underuse of efficacious medications. And asthma can be controlled if through good continuity of care, but oftentimes it's not. This slide here shows birth rates among 15 to 17 year olds. And what it shows is that um, non-Hispanic black teens have birth rates three times as high as whites, while Hispanic teens have birth rates four times as high. If we're going to close the achievement gap, we have to close this gap here. The percentage of high school students who've been in a fight in the United States is about 35% in a given year. We see that here, too, the rates for black and Hispanic students is a much more common experience. While safety in schools is a top priority, unfortunately, this is not currently the case. We see that almost 10% of Hispanic youths have missed one or more day of school in the past month because they were afraid to go to school, to be at school or to travel to or from school. Rates are more than twice as high as for white students, and the rates for black students are more than 50% higher. 
Likewise, we see that black and Hispanic youth are much more likely to be physically inactive. These data show uh, breakfast consumption for children at different age groups. And what, what it shows is that there, the, um, the gaps in breakfast consumption persist, whether we're talking about younger children or older children. While the absolute gap is, uh, while the absolute gap is larger for at age nine, the relative gap is actually larger at age 19. These data here show estimated rates of ADHD, and we see that children in single parent head of households, as well as lower income households have much higher rates. Now, um, these data are kind of astounding. They're staggering numbers. But they're kind of old news. There's nothing new about what I've said so far. Everybody's known this, and these factors are considered what an epidemiologist would call endemic. What is kind of more innovative and, and based on newly published results, maybe in the last decade, is precisely how these factors affect educational outcomes. And I've identified five causal pathways through which health factors influence educational outcomes. Sensory perceptions, cognition, school connectedness and engagement, absenteeism, and dropping out. The uh, sensory perception is pretty self-explanatory. If you can't see and hear well, it's going to make it harder to learn. Cognition is all about thinking, using your memory, solving problems. It's obviously an essential skill for succeeding in school. What's been less obvious or perhaps less well documented until recently is the importance of school connectedness. And researchers have recently shown that to the extent that students feel connected with school, they're much more likely to succeed academically, and they're much less likely to exhibit lots of different health compromising behaviors. The influence of absenteeism and dropouts is fairly self-explanatory. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each of these causal pathways and, and talk briefly about the different ways that health factors influence them. So the first one is sensory perceptions. If you take my glasses away now, I'm going to have a really hard time with the rest of this talk because I won't be able to see my notes. Well, imagine what it's like for a young child learning to read. And that child has hyperopia. They can't see things at close distance. Imagine how much harder that's going to be for them to learn. Inattention and hyperactivity not, is not only associated with problems in vision, but also problems in perception of time. Time, perception of time influences things like organizing tasks and is associated with memory and different aspects of learning. Now cognition. Cognition is about thinking. It's about memory. It's about solving problems. It's about being able to um, organize tasks and sequence them together to come up with solution to problems. And here, vision affects cognition because of it, the connections between the eyes and the brain, visual motor integration. And we know that children have lots of different problems with vision motor in, visual motor integration. Likewise, exposure to violence is associated with intrusive thoughts, impulsiveness, and off-task behavior. Disruptive behavior not only influences learning for the children ex exhibiting the behavior, but also for the other children in the classroom as well. Now, how does physical activity affect cognition? You know, about 4,000 years ago, the Greeks knew intuitively that a strong mind and a strong body were intimately related. But it's only about the last 10 years or so that molecular biologists have really demonstrated the, the reasons why that's the case by showing how physical activity promotes the uh, development of neurotransmitters and brain activity and synapses and things like that that influence our ability to think. We also know that it affects mental health. 
breakfast is associated with uh, thinking as well. You know, breakfast is different than all the other meals because we've been fasting for a period of eight, ten, or, or more hours, and we need nutrition in order to help our brain work. Um, we know the common practice principles use sending a note home before students are going to take their standardized test the next day, urging the parents to make sure that the child not only gets a good night's sleep, but has a good breakfast that day. Well, that should be every day, not just that day. Inattention and hyperactivity, by definition, is associated with cognition. The symptoms themselves focus on things like thinking and using memory and being able to focus attention and not get distracted easily. Asthma and ADHD also are highly associated with sleep disruption. And having five children, that's something I know a lot about. <laughs> um, if you have sleep disruption and you're tired, your mind doesn't work as well. It's not as capable of solving problems, not as capable of paying attention. Look at that. Those same problems affect connectedness with school. Imagine the child is learning how to read but they can't see well. The words are all blurry, the letters are all blurry. No matter how hard they try, they can't succeed. No matter how good the teacher can teach, they can't succeed. No matter how good the curricula is sequenced, and even if it's a high quality, they can't learn. What do you think's gonna happen? They're gonna get demoralized. When they get demoralized, they're gonna feel less engaged at school. They're gonna feel less connected with school. Asthma tends to co also co-occur with lots of different kinds of anxiety. As you might imagine, if you've ever had shortness of breath, you wake up in the night and you can't breathe, and you know that you're at school, and maybe you're in a gym class, and you're afraid you might have an asthma attack. So you have all different kinds of anxiety. It's also associated with depression, and these things interfere with being able to connect with your peers. Physical activity, too, is connected uh, associated with connectedness. Think of the opportunities to connect with peers through physical activity, through teamwork, through cooperation, and things like that. And likewise, breakfast keeps you healthy, keeps you more alert, affects your mental health, and there too affects your ability to connect with other peers. Perhaps one of the saddest byproducts or symptoms of ADHD is children with HD do not have friends. They cannot establish friendships. It not only has incredible, devastating effects on cognition, but it creates tremendous social dysfunction. Now we'll move on to absenteeism. How does asthma cause absenteeism? Asthma causes absenteeism not only because of sleep disruption, which uh, makes children miss school sometimes, but also because children with poorly controlled asthma have to go to doctor's appointments, they get sick more frequently, they have respiratory illness. It's commonly known. 10 million children under 18 have asthma. Aggression and violence is known to cause uh, uh, absenteeism. A slide I showed a few moments ago showed you that uh, when we uh, do surveys, nationally representative surveys, we have almost one in 10 Hispanic youth saying they've missed one or more days in the past month because they were afraid to be at school or travel to or from school. We have to change that. Physical activities associated with absenteeism is, as is breakfast because those things affect mental health and overall well-being and by being more healthy you're going to be less likely to get different kinds of communicable diseases and more likely to attend school. We know that ADHD is associated with uh, absenteeism. It's not really a controversial point. Teen pregnancy is associated with dropping out of school. Now, some people have argued, well, that's because of all the other things that are associated with teen pregnancy, but statistical analysis shows clearly that even if you take half of those factors out, teen pregnancy is known to be an important cause of dropout. Likewise, inattention and hyperactivity is known to be uh, an important cause of high school dropout. In fact, children with ADHD are between two and a half and three times less likely to finish high school. So, what can schools do about this? Well, I've outlined a fairly sim simple 
different approach. It's not overwhelming. To address vision screening, we not all, the vision problems, we not only want to do screening, which is already done in the majority of the nation's school, but we have to have outreach to follow up so that there is uh, the children who, who uh, need services as a result of that screening receive them. On pre site provision of services, how about giving the kids the glasses who need them right there? How about giving them two pair? It's not going to cost that much money. Asthma, we need to have just case management. How about the kids who are poorly con have poorly controlled asthma? Is anybody paying attention to them? Is there a nurse in the school? Well, if you're in an urban public school, there's less likely to be a nurse than if you're in a suburban school. Elimination of environmental triggers. Uh, that can be everything from uh, environmental to pollutants. It could be cockroach allergens. It could be diesel exhaust and particulate matter in the inner city schools. All those things um, can trigger asthma attacks to children who are sensitized, as can paints and cleaning solutions and other kinds of environmental pollutants in school. Schools can also provide education for students with asthma and safe opportunities for physical activity. For teen pregnancy, we need effective skills-based programs, social-emotional learning, contraceptive services for those who are sexually active, and for those who do become pregnant, health and social services. Now, on this next slide concerning aggression and violence, you're going to see some of those same points. Skills-based health education and social and emotional learning. Many of the different health problems have these same underlying solutions. Skills-based learning and social and emotional learning. So we can have 17 different curricula trying to address these simultaneously. We need one that addresses them across the board. Um, the other thing is to provide counseling and psychological services for youth who are exhibiting problems in a safe physical environment through adult supervision and other things such as that. With respect to physical activity, standards-based physical education program, recess, and in-class movement, children need to move around. They can't just be studying all day, sitting at their desk all day. They need to be getting up and moving around. Intramural and after school programs, support for walking and biking to school. These things are kind of things that uh, kids in suburban schools take for granted. For breakfast, universal school breakfast program and allowing students to eat in the classroom. It's acceptable. There's no reason it can't be done. It'll also result in boosting the budgets of schools by doing so. Finally, with respect to inattention and hyperactivity, uh, schools play a key role in assessment, evaluation, and diagnosing children with ADHD. Oftentimes, teachers are the, the first one to recognize that a children may have one of these problems. They're in a key position as opposed to others because they have a normative reference to see what are the other children look, looking like, how are the other children acting, and how likely is it that their behavior is really outside the normal range. Improving student-teacher relationships, organizing the classroom to minimize distractions. One of, the, one of the things they do in the Netherlands, reportedly, is when children are easily distracted, they put those children a lot closer to the teacher's desk, almost touching the teacher's desk, maybe, so the teacher can be aware, and if the child's getting distracted, trying to get them back on track. It's a small thing, but it can have a big effect. A lot of times, the children with ADHD are treated for their symptoms that are disruptive symptoms, but we need more academic interventions to help those children not only exhibit less symptoms, which is often accomplished through psychopharmacological treatments, but also to help them succeed, to learn the skills to succeed. And we need better outreach to parents and partnerships with parents. So, what I see it so far is that there's really an academic imperative to address these health factors. If children can't see well, if their brain doesn't integrate with their eyes, it's going to be harder for them to learn. If children are depressed because they have chronic disease and they can't sleep well at night, it's going to be harder for them to feel connected and succeed in school. If you feel that even if they finish school, the chances for them are bleak anyway, they don't have any aspirations, we're not going to get very far. 
If children are ill-nourished, if they're not physically active, if they don't sleep well, it's going to be hard for them to learn. It's going to be hard for them to be motivated. If children can't come to school and feel a place of community, they're going to be less likely to want to be there. They're going to be less likely to succeed academically and socially. If children have problems paying attention, if they have problems with hyperactivity, which by the way is the most common mental and behavioral health problem in the United States affecting youth, it's going to be much, much harder for them to succeed, not only in school, but in life. Now, all of these problems individually are incredibly important. But what's even more important is the multiple effects of these problems occurring simultaneously. I was doing an interview yesterday, and one of the questions the reporter asked was, well, what's the most important thing to do? And I said, the most important thing to do, the single most important thing to do, is to not do just one thing. <laughs> it's to stop thinking about this problem as having a simple one solution, because it doesn't. The, the most important thing here is to try to address a set of priorities simultaneously. That's what's important. So now uh, I'd like to change in gears and talk about how schools can influence the health of youth. In recent years, there's been increasing recognition of the important role that health plays in academic achievement. We have the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development has issued their new compact for educating the whole child. And we have the broader, bolder approach to education, which is focused on um, the importance of health factors in school. But I like to call this next slide the difference between rhetoric and reality. It's been a lot of rhetoric. One of the first studies I sponsored here at Teachers College uh, asked a sample of school principals, how important is drug abuse prevention in the schools? And I said, oh, it's a very top priority. And I said, well, how much curricular time do you spend on it in the program? I said, oh, about an hour a week. Okay. Unfortunately, too often, we don't have sufficient investment in school health programs. The efforts that we do have are not strategically planned to influence educational outcomes. The programs are of poor quality, and this is documented, this is in my opinion, and the efforts are not effectively coordinated. So what does strategically planned program mean? Well, before we talk about strategic planning, it's important to recognize the context for education in the United States. The United States is different than any other country in the entire world with respect to our educational system. We have a decentralized educational system where the states and really the local communities have control over the policies and what goes on in schools. And therefore, the planning that has to occur has to focus on the local level, where local schools and local leaders and teachers have to identify what are the strategic priorities that they want to focus on. And that isn't something that's done once and then you're done with it. It has to be an ongoing process. Because if you're good at this, the problems are going to change. You're going to solve some of the problems or reduce some, and other problems are going to take precedence. So it has to be an ongoing process. And if we know one thing, we've, we're good at starting programs. We're not good at maintaining programs. So every year, there's a new program started, and then every year, that, there's, that program's gone, and there's another one. How can, the only way we can avoid that vicious cycle is through community involvement through having local people in local schools feel like, wait a minute, this is our program. Now, having said that, there is important things for local folks to recognize, and that is, you know, we've invested billions of taxpayer dollars to evaluate the efficacy of different kinds of programs, and we know what constitutes good programs, and this is, these are uh, available through different publications sponsored by the CDC and other groups. Um, here's examples of the School Health Index, which can help uh, develop quality programs and the Health Education Curriculum Assessment Tool and the Physical Education Curriculum Assessment Tool. And we have the uh, SAMHSA's National Repository of Evidence-Based Programs, and there's the 
uh, coalition for evidence-based programs that have identified these programs that work. But recent research has shown that the majority of schools in the United States use programs that have no evidence of effectiveness. You can see this with the DARE program, that is probably one of the most widely used program in the United States, and you can see this with abstinence only before marriage sex education programs, which have had uh, very limited evidence of uh, effectiveness. Uh, the recent study by Loretta Jamat notwithstanding, which was a very good study. The other element of uh, effective and efficient programs is effective coordination. So what does effective coordination mean? It basically means that different people in the school are playing different roles, but they're trying to achieve the same common goals. And without effective coordination, um, we really don't use our resources efficiently. So one example of this is imagine you have the health department come in and do a vision screening. So now say, oh, it looks like you might have a problem with the acuity in your vision. So we're going to send the note home to the parents. Well, the parents have to be responsible to now take the child to an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, have an eye exam, get a pair of glasses if necessary, replace those glasses if the child loses or breaks the glasses, which you know is going to happen. And then the teacher has to help ensure that the child uses the glasses when they're trying to learn the academic tasks in school. So if we break the, any one of those links, we're not going to have the benefit of the screening program. We're not going to have the benefits. To coordinate these different disparate efforts, these different components, you need somebody to play a role, a coordinative role. You need a school health coordinator. We also need a school health counselor or a leadership team. And these components can really facilitate the coordination process. Unfortunately, the way that we are organized is based on what I call the silo approach. And the, you, you remember the one of the earlier graphics where we talked about the importance, the interrelationships between health education and poverty. While the problems are interrelated, the solutions are categorical and siloed. I think there's encouraging signs that that's starting to change, and I'm very hopeful about that. But right now, even within each one of those silos, the, the programs are tremendously categorical. So if you look at the NIH, we don't have um, the programs that focus on research of the whole child. They focus on you know, heart disease and cancer and diabetes. And that is not an efficient way to go. This is the model that's advocated by the Centers for Disease Control. It's a good example of an attempt to try to promote coordination. It talks about these eight different components of a school health program and the need to coordinate these different components so that different people are working together toward common goals. So how do we need to help schools do this? Schools are under tremendous pressures. Another question I was asked recently is, how can we expect schools to take this on? They already have so much to do. How can they possibly do something else in addition? And I said, well, I have the utmost respect for the teachers in the nation's schools and the incredible job they do. And I know that it's uh, going to be a burden to ask them to take something else like this on. But we have to recognize that if we don't, all the other efforts that they're trying will be jeopardized they're not going to succeed. It's not a choice. It's an educational imperative. Health education, school health programs have to become a fundamental part of the mission of schools. Or all these other efforts are going to have limited effectiveness. So how do we need to help? Well, we need to help by communicating that point I just made. School health has to be a fundamental part of the mission of schools. It's not right now. It's peripheral. It's peripheral in schools, it's peripheral in colleges of education. That's one of the most important things. That is the single most important thing that we need to change. It's a change in where these issues fall in terms of the priorities of the nation's schools. 
Policy mandates and accountability is very, very important. You see how the uh, current accountability system has influenced teaching and learning in the classrooms across America. Very, very powerful. Well, we want to have some of those account accountability measures incorporate health-related issues, connectedness with school, school climate, for example. We need more financial support. Although we are spending a lot of money right now, the magnitude and scope of these problems is so great that we need even more investment. We need guidance, technical assistance, and professional development. Um, I'd like to focus in now on what I think is the key opportunity we have now. We, I think I, uh, many people share my optimism and hope about the uh, President Barack Obama and the current administration in Washington and the value that is being placed on our most precious resource, our nation's children. Uh, President Obama has invested unprecedented amounts of money in the nation's schools. And now is a key time for change through the Department of Education. And the uh, Department of Education has identified four key st strategies right now. Uh, and we want to try to find ways that health-related issues can be integrated into these strategies. When we talk about distribution of highly effective teachers, highly effective teachers are going to be able to know how to recognize a child with ADHD or the symptoms of poor vision or a problem when a child has asthma and they're sleepy and they come to school. An effective teacher is going to be able to know how to implement uh, social and emotional learning issues. They're going to know how to help minimize and avoid interpersonal conflict in their classroom. We need to focus on the lowest performing schools. Well, I agree with that. Guess what? Those lowest performing schools academically, those are the same schools. Those 5,000 schools in the United States are the same schools where the children have the greatest health disparities. If we focus on the educational agenda in those schools without focusing on the, ed on the health issues, those efforts are going to be jeopardized. Improving data systems and assessment standards is also important. We need to show that by incorporating these health measures into these systems, uh, they can help guide us in strategic planning and evaluation. So these are just some examples of uh, recommendations that I think are worthy of consideration. And I uh, hope uh, they warrant at least some discussion. We need a national school health strategic plan from the Department of Education. We've never had a plan like that. And I'm incredibly optimistic and hopeful that now's an opportune time now is an opportune time for such a plan to be created and then implemented. We also need incentives for involvement for school leaders and teachers throughout the nation. And we need human capital grant programs to help uh, provide support for young people to work in the schools, to learn how to become school health coordinators, school health teachers, school nurses, social workers, school psychologists, and so forth. And, um, I've already mentioned integrating measures like school climate and connectedness into the data systems of the U.S. Department of Education, the Institute for Educational Sciences, which it doesn't have these measures right now, and to integrate health into the Department of Education research agenda, which is basically not present at this time, but very helpful. It can be integrated in the future. So here's some just examples of policy development that uh, I believe would be helpful to integrate health-related measures into accountability systems, as I've mentioned. Very, very important to include health goals in the mandated school improvement plans. So schools are required to have a school improvement plan. Why not have some health goals in those school improvement plans? It's centrally important. It's an educational imperative. Establish school health council and leadership teams in the schools. Now, you know, this is asking a lot of people in the schools. It really is. And they probably are going to need a lot of help in learning how to do these things. And I think through the guidance, technical assistance, and professional development is a role that the state education departments can play a really, really important role. And they can foster professional development. They can help create learning communities and within states and within regions. And also with guidance from the federal government, from the Centers for Disease Control, from the Department of Education, uh, which in turn can 
be filtered through the state education departments. Data collection and research. Now, um, I've been doing research here for uh, quite a while. And um, sure, we could learn more about how to improve the health of youth. But you know what? That's not the kind of research we need most urgently now. The kind of research we need most urgently now is to find the best ways to put what we already know into practice. I'm not talking about in 10 schools or 50 schools or 100 schools. I'm talking about in thousands of schools throughout the nation. That's what we need to concentrate on. It's telling that you can read through the research and you'll see we don't know virtually anything about our users. We have some people in the business world here today. Step one, know your customer. Our customer is the school teachers and the school leaders in the nation's schools. What do they think about the importance of this? Do they care about it? What skills do they have? What skills do they want? We don't know anything about that because no research, virtually no research, has been done on this topic. What is the kinds of evidence valued by legislators? They're the ones that control the dollars in the United States. They're the ones in Congress that make the allocations to the Division of Adolescent and School Health and other uh, entities such as that, what do they value? Well, a lot of times those decisions might be based on things like, well, you know, my grandchild had this problem, it's important, we have to deal with it. That's not a strategic focus. We need to have a more sensible approach to investment of our social resources. Uh, finally, um, you know, I don't want to take an easy shot at the colleges of education, which would be easy to do, but I think you know, what we're trying to do is have a new breed of teachers. And um, up till now, the colleges of education haven't really done enough. They haven't done enough to prepare their teachers to be cognizant of these issues. The school administrator programs have not really sensitized the leaders to how to do their job uh, by incorporating health into their mission. Uh, there's some encouraging signs of forming school and university partnerships to facilitate the implementation of these and other programs and, and that's very good and I think the colleges of education in the United States can really lead a national movement to try to get this issue on the college of education agenda and uh, I appreciate all of your patience and uh, quietly listening to my comments and I would just say uh, that addressing the Health disparities of urban minority youth in the United States is not only a moral, but an educational imperative. Thank you very much. I think we should keep that picture up there, don't you? It's a wonderful illustration of what we're talking about. Well, thank you, Chuck. You're welcome. And have a glass of water. You must be thirsty after that marathon presentation, but how rich and informative that was and clear. I Thank think you. you, it was very, really terrific presentation. And one of the things you called for was leadership from the U.S. Department of Education. And I know Arnie Duncan has sent us one of his best leaders today and Matt Yale. So let's uh, hear some comments from Mr. Yale. Um, so clearly we have a lot on our plate. and. Uh, uh, Professor Bosch, I think that was very clear. Um, the direction that we want to go, trust me, I'm reminded. My mom, who's a graduate of this school, she says I don't call her enough, but when I do call, it reminds me, what did you do today to help, literally? It's cliche, but she every time, and that's sort of where we are. Um, our department was fortunate enough through the Recovery Act to receive more money. Uh, our budget doubled, literally overnight, and we recognize that if we don't do this now and we don't do it well, Every naysayer in public education will simply say, you gave money to the problem and nothing changed. So the urgency of our work, we have 4,100 employees in the department, almost 40% of which have been there for 20 years or more. So we have a workforce that realizes this is it, like this is our final tour. Um, obviously, I'm not one of the people who's been there 20 years or more, um, but our political team and our career team are working closer than ever. Uh, just last week, as you saw, we announced our race to the top grants. We had career employees who were sleeping over in the Department of Education, literally spending the night to make sure that the program got out, um, which it did. So just know that you talk about 
an urgency for us to do something, uh, you know, we're on it. Um, mm -hmm. But we ask everyone, you know, hold our feet to the fire. And the secretary will be the first person to tell you that he needs to hear what we're doing well and what we're doing wrong. Um, and, you know, we're, we don't have all the answers. So I'll say that clearly. So just started, you know, $80 billion in the Recovery Act. Um, immediately the money we put in was meant to keep the car in neutral instead of reverse. We saved 300,000 education jobs last year. Obviously not enough, and we're hoping to get some more money in the jobs bill as it comes forward in the next iteration of the jobs bill. But the other money that we have is more competitive money than every Secretary of Education combined. Okay? So you date back to the first Secretary of Education in Carter's administration all the way through the last. Annually, you could take the money they had competi for competitive grants. We have more money than they all have combined. So it's an incredible opportunity. Race to the top is an example. So is the Investing in What Works Fund. Our promised neighborhoods, which you mentioned in your paper, we have $10 million this year as a planning grant, and then $250 million in 2011 um, budgeted to really make these investments and in changing the way we do business in the Department of Education. Um, now, when it comes to health, this is going to be cliche, but we realize that if a student needs to learn and has the opportunity to learn, they have to be healthy. And we saw this firsthand with H1N1, which uh, is an example of one thing I would dispute in the paper, which is I don't think we're siloed anymore. If you had a diagram, it'd be more of a Venn diagram because our department, USDA, HHS, DOT, um, everyone sort of put aside their own program and realized, this, and H1N1 is actually the best example, that if we don't do something fundamentally different, kids aren't going to be able to be in the building. So we changed um, how schools were monitored. Um, the guidance we had to make sure was very clear for the first time. The Department of Education actually helped write CDC guidance. Um, USDA was making sure that the millions and millions of kids who get meals in their school every day um, were able to receive the food at a mobile site because they were going to go hungry if buildings were closed. Um, so an example of where government is starting to work together and not apart. And I hope that you'll see a, a lot more of that. Um, in terms of health, you all have seen the First Lady has jumped at this, and I use that pun intended, to let's move, and has created a, a multi-faceted, you know, interagency and private partnership campaign around childhood obesity. And this is her signature issue, and it will be um, for the rest of the administration. And what's so unique about this is she's a parent. And this is a message we use time and time again, that the First Lady and the President are where they are because of education and do what they do because they have children and understand the value of education. So she as a mother and a parent realizes this Let's Move initiative is much deeper than a government program, but it truly has to be something that you know, is pervasive in everyday life. Schools. Um, fortunately, are one of the four key pillars. And the way that we've tackled this issue is to, first and foremost, rely on our stakeholders and get in front of them and say, what can you do to help us make schools healthier? So the Council of Great City Schools, National Association of uh, Parent PTA, um, you name it. We brought them all to the White House and said, what can you do in the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years to combat childhood obesity? We have a commitment that 5,000 schools in the coming year, urban schools, will attempt to be gold standard for a U.S. Healthier Challenge. <laughs> we have 600 U.S. Healthier schools right now. So 5,000, which is not even the tip of the iceberg. It's not a school in every district. We have 14,000 districts, so we have a long way to go. But to go from 600 to 5,000 would be a, a huge, huge move. Um, and we use that as our benchmark. We believe that if we can get all schools to be that healthier gold medal, that's the kind of school I'd send my child to without a packed lunch. And that's where we're shooting for. Um, you know, I guess some of the questions that rise now are the, the, the choice, do teachers have the opportunity to teach math and reading and science, or they should be teaching exactly what you're talking about? And we see that as a false choice. Uh, Arnie will be the first to tell you school days are just too short. Uh, we have to change in this country. We can no longer think of buildings going from 9 to 3, but they should be open 9 to 3 and then 3 to 9. It's funny, every time he says that or any of our senior team are out talking, we always get booed by students. 
who hate to hear that, especially when we say, well, you probably should be in school in summer too, unless you're farming, which isn't much of the population anymore. Um, but all honestly, we need to have kids in the building longer. And it's not just the teachers who need to be teaching, but it's the community organizations who we need to see in the building in the after school hours, making sure our kids are you know, fed well and have other programs like physical activity and all the things that just, frankly, there's not time in the day right now. We've seen districts, you guys have probably seen the headlines lately, going to four days next year. I mean, it's unbelievable. So no matter how much more money we can find in the federal government to put towards this, we're up against a really tough wall. Now the political reality is going to catch up and governors are going to have to stop going into the education budget and have to look to make other cuts because this is just not sustainable. We've got a goal in mind that 2020, the president has asked all of us to think about how do we return to number one in the world in graduation rates. Well, we're not going to get there in college completion if we're going four days a week. <laughs> We're also not going to get there if we don't have some of the health and wellness issues that you're talking about addressed in a really thoughtful way. So we're on it. We don't have the right answers yet, but we're working on it. You know, and the final thing I'd say, and then I'll um, wait for questions, is, you know, um, I think that so much of this, and you've said it really well, is seen through the lens of what's the one thing that you can do. And there is no silver bullet. Um, but what I think that the department can do and will start to do better is finding the programs that work and trying to replicate those throughout the country. So, for example, in Baltimore, where 85,000 public school kids are eating a healthy meal every day at no extra expense than the typical reimbursement the USDA gives them, um, or a program like we had run in Chicago where 110 public schools on Friday afternoons get a backpack for some of the kids who need that meal for the rest of the weekend finding these little things that work and replicating them. You're right, there should not be a kid in America who can't see the board. There should be eyeglasses in every school. You know, Arnie has been very clear there aren't enough school nurses. We would love a school nurse in every single building. Um, so there's not one answer. I think hopefully we're focused um, and are going to proceed thoughtfully and you know, really start to chip away at what is a problem, and we recognize that. Thank you. You know, one of the specific suggestions was about a strategic plan for the department to have around health education and health promotion. Is that on the screen? Well, what's on the screen is we're in the process of reauthorizing uh, ESEA, or No Child Left Behind. And one of the things that we've proposed is a Safe Healthier Schools initiative, which is $410 million. It's about a $41 million increase from our budget in 2010. And um, there's room in that for not us to create the plan, but for people to come to us and say, here would be a, a blueprint of how we would do this. And I think that's what you're gonna see a lot more from the Department of Education. Instead of us trying to come up with solutions, we're gonna put money out competitively and looking for those who have the solution for us to fund them. I think we might have a few ideas in this room, so thank you very much. We will have plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience, but before we do that, we're gonna hear from Dr. Wexler. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back home at TC. Uh, and I want to start by echoing uh, what, what Matt said. The degree of collaboration and the destruction of turf battles uh, between the departments from, from the HHS perspective uh, in collaborating with the Department of Ed and Department of Agriculture is, is truly unprecedented, uh, and I think we're making progress. A lot of our focus at CDC, though, is providing support to states and, and, and local education agencies uh, and trying to help them in collaboration with their health departments. And we've made some progress, and uh, we still have a long way to, to go there. I find myself this afternoon in a very unaccustomed position because I'm usually the data and evaluation geek from CDC who's going to throw out slide after slide packed with data and then synthesize the evaluation findings to make sense of the research, and this guy's done it all. Uh, I think Dr. Bash's research has been incredibly thorough, accurate, insightful, and he's truly amassed and analyzed the research in a very, very productive way, and the evidence is clearly compelling. The health problems, uh, these health problems he uh, touched on, and, and there are others, affect large numbers of students with a disproportionate impact on urban minority youth. The health disparities play an important role in perpetuating the education achievement gap, and we have proven strategies that schools can implement and 
A substantial minority of schools are implementing them, which is an important message to get across for all the, uh, for the majority of schools that are not, that it actually can be done, and it can be done in urban minority settings as well. His entire paper, I think, makes a great contribution to the field, not only of school health, but of educational reform. And I think perhaps the greatest contribution is that this is probably the first time I've seen a very plausible and systematic attempt to explain those causal pathways, to actually document how it is that the health problems influence educational uh, performance. So I have very little to add to uh, improve the evidence base that Dr. Bash has laid out for us. But I do want to comment on this, this search for evidence in this area. See, I have the privilege of working closely with hundreds of educators across the country, see some of them in this room, who with great passion, energy, and integrity work hard every day to implement exactly the type of high quality evidence-based strategically planned and effectively coordinated school health programs that Dr. Bash recommends. And they do this with great passion because they believe, as Dr. Bash does, that reducing the health barriers to learning is an essential strategy for academic achievement. And they believe that promoting good health is not peripheral, but it is central to the fundamental mission of schools. And whenever they speak up on behalf of school coordinated school health programs, they invariably hear from policymakers the same question. Where's the evidence? Well, I think Dr. Bash has presented for us an enormous amount of evidence, and I think those uh, school health professionals across the nation are going to gobble up this uh, new resource that they have. But this search for evidence is really a very interesting thing. I wish more often we could turn the tables and ask the policymakers that very same question. I'll give you a good example. About two decades ago, this country, uh, many, many uh, school systems across the country embarked on a major social experiment. They decided that they would cut back dramatically on the time that students spend in physical education. So kids today get a lot less physical education than anyone on, on this panel did when, when we were in school. The assumption was less time in the gymnasium, more time in the classroom would lead to higher test scores. I want to ask the question. Where's the evidence? They introduced this massive social change, and we've seen some of the results. We know that the great cutback in physical education has contributed to the obesity epidemic that every single pu public health leader will tell you is one of the greatest public health challenges facing the nation, and it in fact threatens to sap the economic competitiveness of our nation. But they went ahead to do it, and they're still doing it across the, the country. Where is the evidence that this was a sound strategy for improving learning and educational achievement? The CDC has a report coming out next month that is the most comprehensive uh, and highest quality review of the evidence to date on the impact that school-based physical activity programs, including physical education, have on educational achievement. Guess what? We did not find any evidence that cutting back on physical education time leads to improved academic performance. And we found plenty of evidence showing that participation in high quality physical education can indeed improve academic performance. But somehow this notion that health is a key strategy for improving academic achievement, that health is a fundamental part of the mission of school, somehow that's gotten lost in the, the fads of educational reform that have gripped uh, the policymakers over the past two decades. In fact, a lot of uh, the school health professionals across the nation, when they speak up and they advocate for, for coordinated school health, they get the feeling sometimes that people are eyeing them as if they're some kind of crazy radicals. Worse that they're being looked at as uh, trying to introduce some kind of distraction mm -hmm. from the essential mission of American schools. But that, that's not the history of American schools I learned at Teachers College. I think they've got it all wrong. They got it all backwards. Because this notion that health leads to improved academic performance and that it's a fundamental part of the mission of American schools, that is profoundly American. Mm -hmm. 1749, Benjamin Franklin said, Pennsylvania should establish public schools that places much emphasis on physical as on intellectual fitness because exercise invigorates the soul as well as the body. And guess where we're located now? None other than Horace Mann Hall, the revered father of American education. He was back there at the beginning when the American public education system was created and he wrote, on the broad and firm foundation of health alone can the loftiest and most enduring structures of the intellect be reared. Somehow in the din and clamor of, of school reform efforts over the past decades, 
Too many of us have lost sight of this vision. Too many of us have lost sight of the connection between health and education. But this is not a radical notion. In fact, this is widely supported by most of the American public and m many of the key power structures in our country. Every single sur national survey of parents has found strong support for the types of programs that Dr. Bash has highlighted. One survey found 81% of parents of school-aged children want their kids to get daily physical education. Two-thirds of them strongly agreed that physical education has a positive impact on academic performance. Three out of four said health education was at least as important as the so-called core subjects of math, science, and language arts. The corporate community widely supports the kinds of uh, health uh, interventions that Dr. Bash talked about. There was a, a couple of years ago, a number of business organizations came together. They did a survey of uh, more than 400 of the largest corporate employers. They asked them, besides basic literacy, besides basic numeracy, what are the important content areas that schools should be teaching? Guess what came out number one? By far, number one. 76% of the respondents said it was most critical, the number one choice of the corporate community, making appropriate choices concerning health and wellness. And Dr. Bass showed you some of the uh, recent uh, publications. Uh, uh, it seems every proposal now that's coming out uh, for, for, for school reform, such as from the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, seems that every one of them is recognizing the importance of, of uh, school health programs uh, as part of education reform. It, you didn't get to see it much in detail, but uh, the ASCD proposal, which by the way has been their new compact, which has been endorsed by dozens of the other leading professional associations, they summarize their compact in five words. Five words of what the obligation of schools to students are. The obligations are to ensure that students are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. I didn't write those first two, they did. Healthy and safe. Many, many more groups across the country are starting to get it. And yes, Dr. Bash, it is still at the level of rhetoric, but we are seeing pockets of progress. And when we see that progress, it points out it can be done. These notions, the ideas that he has put forth, they are feasible, even in very challenging times. And in fact, this is an opportune time because over the past decade, two decades, we have developed quite an impressive evidence base about what needs to be done and how to do it effectively. And, 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 and I'm with him. I'm a public health researcher. There's nothing that would please me more than to get up here and say, we need billions of dollars more for research, and uh, we have to maximize the effect size of, of these interventions, and we haven't quite figured out how to do that. Yeah, that would be nice. But there's so much that we already know. And there are so many things that we already know that do not have a heavy paycheck. And I don't want to distract from the fact that, that yes, there are major investments that do need to be made. There are important steps we can take even in this di difficult economic time. I want to echo the emphasis Dr. Bash put on strategic planning, effective coordination, and integration into the accountability structure. He mentioned one thing, and I just want to go back to it. I don't think we've ever seen the type of progress that happens in schools in terms of addressing these educationally relevant health disparities as much when they are told you must include health goals in your school improvement plan. That is a very simple and very profound way to increase accountability. And as Matt said, to change the way they do business, to make sure that Horace Mann's concept does in fact live. Uh, he, he mentioned it in passing on his slides, uh, school health coordinators. The state of Tennessee, pretty poor state, the state of Tennessee has a line item now in its budget. They've allocated $15 million Every single school district in the state of Tennessee, first state to do this, every single school district has a school health coordinator. It can be done in Tennessee, in Memphis, in Nashville. It can be done in other urban areas as well. Fourteen states now require every school district to have a school health council to address these issues uh, head on. Two states require every school to do the CDC's school health index for self-assessment and planning. These things can be done. These are the kinds of structural changes 
that help schools integrate health into their fundamental mission. They help them manage their approaches uh, to school health uh, efficiently. They help ensure sustainability, and they build their capacity to address multiple health issues, because as Dr. Bash said, it is addressing multiple issues and having that synergy that makes all the difference. And they help schools tap into important community resources. And one community resource we stress a lot is the importance of school systems working with their local and state health departments and the voluntary health organizations in their community. I want you to know there's a growing movement within public health that argues that public health professionals need to support education reform, the type of educational mm -hmm. interventions that, that, that Matt talked about, uh, that, that that needs to be seen as a profoundly public health intervention as well. In fact, one of our healthy people objectives, the health objectives uh, for the nation that the Public Health Service monitors, one of them is increase the percentage of students who graduate from high school because we know there are strong independent effects of educational achievement on health outcomes. Each sector, health, public health, education has its strengths. One of the things we do at uh, CDC in our core program of uh, supporting states to implement uh, coordinated school health we provide funding to state education agencies, but only if they come in as a full partner with their state health department. And they have to share some of the money with the state health department. These are structural ways that we get, and by the way, they don't speak the same language. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> they come from entirely different cultures. They don't communicate. They don't, typically, they don't get along well. This carrot has played a major role in getting them to work together. We provide them professional development on how to do that. And we've even gone so far as to commission uh, uh, training documents. We uh, commissioned the National Association of State Boards of Education, which is a key uh, education policy group, to write a, a, a book for people who work in health departments. It's called How Schools Work and How to Work with Schools. And if you've ever worked with people from health departments, you know what I'm talking about. They need that. Uh, and then we have the sequel. We've engaged the National Association of Chronic D Disease Directors, the people who run chronic disease prevention programs in state health departments. We've engaged them, and they have produced uh, a, a book called, can you guess, How Health Departments Work <laughs> and How to Work with Health Departments. Uh, because p they, people need, uh, someone said collaboration is a, an unnatural act between consenting adults, uh, and you need a tremendous amount of help to make that happen. So yes, healthy students are better learners, and people are starting to get that. We just got to have it happen a lot quicker. On February 9th of this year, the state of Michigan, State Board of Education, passed a, a policy that encouraged all their school districts to integrate social emotional learning across their curriculum. On March 2nd, the state of Nebraska, which has not been at the forefront of school health uh, innovation, the state of Nevada, Nebraska, uh, their State Board of Education adopted a policy for coordinated school health that encouraged each school district and school to develop, adopt, and implement a comprehensive plan for coordinated school health based on the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention model for coordinated school health. And it goes on with other details as, as well. We've got pockets growing, which again proves the case. This is feasible. This can be done. Now we've got to take it up uh, to a much higher level. We need this to be systematic, widespread, and particularly focused in urban areas. I want to close with a little story about a site visit I made to a school in Middleton, Wisconsin. Now this is not a, a, a very urban area, but the principal there said things that I've heard repeated over and over again in, by school health professionals in urban areas. He just said it so beautifully, I, I always like to relate this. I went to the school, and when you walk in there, now this was a couple of years ago, this was about four or five years ago, this was at the peak of the fever around No Child Left Behind, and every, every sentence of every educator in America, of every principal in America, included the three letters AYP, adequate yearly progress. When people were most obsessed uh, with the consequences of not making adequate yearly progress, and most concerned uh, about uh, uh, No Child Left Behind. You walked into this school, the first thing you saw over the place were colorful posters about fruits and vegetables uh, and, and, and healthy eating. You went in the classrooms, you saw innovative, state-of-the-art nutrition education, cafeteria at lunchtime, they're still teaching the kids uh, how to make uh, healthier choices. After school, they had cooking classes for the students uh, and, and their parents uh, to participate in. And I couldn't help it, I had to, to, to ask this principal, I said, how are you doing this? How are you putting your emphasis, your resources, your energy into this stuff when every, all everyone's talking about is average yearly progress and, and no child left behind and, and, and most of all improving those standardized test scores? 
Well, this principal looked at me like I was some naive fool from some other planet, and he said, but this is going to help their, improve their test scores. Yeah. Well, I wanted to pounce on him, and I was going to be the devil's advocate, and I was going to you know, ask him all sorts of questions, put him on the spot. He didn't give me a chance. He just leaned back, and he said, and besides, it's good for the kids. Yeah. Where have we lost that? Yeah. How have we lost that over the past couple of decades? Well, if we really want to do what's good for the kids, well, then addressing educationally relevant health disparities has got to be a fundamental part of the mission of our schools. So aren't you glad we have these friendly feds working for us? It's, it's wonderful to hear your sense of urgency and your passion and commitment. While you all are lining up at the microphones with your comments and questions, and there are, there are microphones right down on the front in, on both aisles, I'm going to pose a couple of questions to our panel, and anybody can jump in. Um, I found a lot to be hopeful about in Dr. Bash's paper, but one thing I was very concerned about was the extent to which schools are using ineffective curricula and programs. And, and Dr. Bash made the point when he was at, at the microphone, and it reminded me of an adage I once heard from a colleague who said, who opined that no bad idea goes unduplicated, <laughs> which I, in my experience have uh, unfortunately found out to be true. And I'm interested in, um, particularly in the discussants ideas about what um, policymakers can do to make sure that we really are using evidence-based, um, that schools and their, and their partners are using evidence-based approaches to promoting the health of our young people. Well, I'll jump right in. There's one thing that just boggles my mind. So you talk about universal breakfast and breakfast in schools, which is one of your points that we absolutely have to start feeding kids in the building. Two states allow um, curriculum time to be used to have breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. Other states, they don't allow it. So serving a kid a meal, teachers will say, is taking away from curriculum time, which to us makes no sense. In Chicago Public Schools, all the teachers get a free breakfast to encourage them to allow for breakfast to be served in the classroom. It's not expensive. It's a simple little thing. These are one of the things where I don't understand why policy is what it is, and it's frustrating at the federal government level. We see something like that, and our hope is we can push states to start thinking differently about breakfast, for example, and incorporating it as a piece of curriculum at the, as the day starts. Yeah, we've got a lot of registries now that identify uh, effective programs, and that's great, and some states are passing policies saying that schools have to choose uh, from those uh, programs. You can do that all you want, and it's not going to get done. It's not going to have the impact that it had in the research study, in the research environment, unless you have an infrastructure in place to support, the provide the professional development, the guidance, the technical uh, assistance. Uh, one example of that is, you know, we, we, we support uh, states to help school districts implement coordinated school health programs and address some of the leading health problems that face our young people. We only have funding uh, to provide that support to 22 states. So the majority of states uh, don't even have that very simple level of infrastructure uh, in place. And until we have you know, boots on the ground, until we have uh, uh, trained people at, at the district level and at the state level who can uh, provide the expertise on how to implement these evidence-based programs, we're, we're still going to uh, be limited in our progress. The preceding program was brought to you by Teachers College, Columbia University, please visit us online at itunes.tc.columbia.edu.